is question and answer time. Yay! Yeah, like I'm the guy to ask questions. Well, no, you don't ask him. You answer. I, I'm, you, the, I'm the guy to answer questions. Yeah, you're the guy. You're the yeah. you're the the brains of this operation. <laughs> oh, man, we're in trouble. <laughs> you are the one who are gu is guiding this ship with a laser beam, Howie. Focus. <laughs> Focus. <laughs> um, Last time I focused was trying to cook a three course meal for my family this evening. That my focus is done. That was. I'm not wearing. I've got my shorts on, so yeah, just don't go there. My wife won't let me wear speedos anymore. I'm not 20. <sighs> Thank you, Lori. Yeah, <laughs> there's one. There's one for give give a shout out. Ah, uh, okay. We've got some questions that were sent in this past week. We've got a, a a discussion topic that we're going to get into, and then we're going to uh, kind of branch off and uh, answer some questions you guys have if you've got some. Beyond if we have pants on or not, we'll kind of leave that one to the side for now. Thanks for sure. <laughs> uh, if you're watching this out on Facebook Live, we are live both there and on YouTube. We're going to be following the YouTube chat just a little bit more in the description of the video. Show 2 is what you want to click on, and you can bounce out to be with our YouTube channel, which will give you a little bit cleaner video, a little bit better audio, and you're going to see the chat room where there's there's all sorts of interesting discussions going on. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Uh, They're getting rather comfortable, aren't they? Uh, Ian, Ian, yeah. if it's a question you can ask here, I, yeah, because I can't, um, it's that or Facebook message me, either one. I can, I can see Messenger uh, because it comes in on the phone uh facebook uh, or, or that so whichever works the best for you okay so let's get into it uh we're going to start with lighting because you know they, some mm -hmm. people view you as the lighting guy i know it's ridiculous but go and ahead what do you got? the question is is are corded up lights better than cordless up lights these days well i i don't really know it depends on the application i guess for me personally sometimes it's a lot of work to charge a whole bunch of lights pre-gig because i don't want to charge them days beforehand i want for i don't know just for my own peace of mind i want fresh charges in them when they go out the door so typically if i'm gigging saturday night they're charging friday evening and i pack them saturday morning and then they go in the truck uh, set up a breeze but the prep time on it is is pretty intense so if I know I'm going into a venue where there's a lot of power, sometimes I just run corded because I don't have to mess around with all that prep. Mm -hmm. How about brightness? Is there a difference in brightness between some of the battery powered to the plug-in? No, no. I, I, in fact, I've got some, I've got some Dodge parts that are battery powered and they'll blind you. Mm -hmm. So brightness is an issue. LED has such a, uh, it's so efficient that power consumption of the diodes themselves is pretty low so you can even do the the cob chip on board diodes and you know battery power they use next to no power and they're blinding bright so no that that's not even an issue if you get the good i mean there's cheap stuff out there of course but if you're buying decent stuff you're going to be fine i think with the battery powered stuff but you don't always need it you know i i tried to explain this in a video a while back where Lighting like PARs and bars and battery powered and corded, they're all kind of like tools in your toolbox. I mean, you don't just have one kind of screwdriver. Mm -hmm. Screwdriver drawer. You've got shorties, long ones. You've got jeweler screwdrivers. You've got, you know, big giant stuff. I mean, you got all kinds of stuff. You got flatheads that are all gouged because you use them for prying on things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just another, these are tools. And I think it's good to have a variety instead of all one of the same so you can do different stuff depending on what you got to do. And you ultimately end up saving money if, if you can not get all battery powered, you know, COB, Wi-Fi lights. You don't always need them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, my, my, my uplights of, of preference right now are the five P's. They're mm -hmm. corded. And you have to, you know, there's no, nothing wireless for them. But as I, I've mentioned in the past is I've got my, my totes with the lights in that and I don't have to worry about charging them. I don't have to deal with any of that. I basically get there and I run a 10 foot uh, uh, XLR between them and I run a 10 foot, uh, I bought some cords to go between them yeah. and every 10 feet along the wall. I mean, it does take some time. I'll give you that. But yeah, it's not terrible though. Especially if you get two hands. Yeah, it, it, it moves along fairly well. And then I have complete control if I want to change lights and such. 
I'm doing a gig this weekend where I have to backlight 10 tables and the round tables. And there's no way that I could do this well with corded lights. Mm -hmm. I need battery powered lights to do this on Mm -hmm. these particular 10 tables. But there are going to be other lights I'm going to have in the room that are going to be corded because it just makes more sense. Just it, it makes more sense economically for when I purchase them and it, it and I've got plenty of power. So it's not an issue. Nice. But those those tools, those battery powered lights they're going to be using under tables. Um, yeah, I'm really happy I have them. There's no other way to do it. So it's just that's the right tool for that job. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I don't particularly need it to do head table up lighting because there's plenty of power there. Generally, yep, there's nice, nice power around there. Okay, let's jump to our next one. We've got uh, Ian put one here. Ian, I'm just going to read it here. Mm. It, um, he's got event August 6th. It's an MMA cage fight event. They call it uh, uh, two lights on the inside of the cage so the fighters are seen better by the mm. guests. Uh, they got quotes for totems, but it was over their budget. Uh, he's got four Global Trust ST-132 stands uh, at the top of the cage, so it's nine foot or so to the lights. Uh, four foot higher than a cage. Yeah. Uh, what, what his question is: What lights would they use to wash wash the cage, but not blind the fighters? That's so, an angle issue. So yeah, you're you're up there. He's up four feet above and and pointing right down. Four feet above, like uh, above their heads, above the, above the cage. cage. And if he's nine feet, and the cage is nine feet, so we're looking at thirteen feet up. Is that hang, right? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna I'm gonna try to see if I can find. Um, so Ian, is it, is it how far from the deck where the fighters are going to be standing to the height of your lights? That's what we really need to know. If you can give us that in the, uh, well, regardless section. of the answer, this is all, this all has to do with angles. And I think if you really wanted to, uh, do something, you know, if they're on a budget and you're just going to use your cars, use some filters and throw some frost filters in there. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Yeah. It, it's going to help, uh, keep that direct, you know, light off of their eyes it's going to give it a better dispersion and it's going to you know wider wash i guess i think that's probably your best bet regardless of how high this is or where the placement is of them i think that's probably your best bet is to go ahead and put some filters on them but if you go to any event like a wrestling event or a boxing event or whatever there are lights on these fighters Mm -hmm. so they're usually way up in the air i mean if it's an arena but there are lights on them. So, you know, there are going to be times when perhaps they're in a position where they're going to be you know, looking at these. But again, if you use the filters, I, I, I think it's probably neg- neg- negligible. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I think the diffuser, and Jimmy mentioned that, a couple of did that, mentioned that idea of getting some diffusers. And some of the some of those those uh, sheets of diffuser paper actually will, will kind of give you a wider Yeah, it will. It'll give you wider beam angle, and that's that's kind of a cool additional thing with this, especially if he's trying to do that. It'll it'll also smooth out the edges of the spot, and uh, I just want to throw this out there too: if you do this and it feels too bright, dim your lights. I mean, most even if you don't DMX anything, most LED pars now with with nice LED menus on the back with the buttons, you can dim that stuff. So if it feels too bright, dim it. Mm-hmm. And, and make it make it where it feels like it it makes more sense. Yeah, he's saying the venue lighting isn't enough. People were asking about that. I mean, the other the other alternative is, of course, to go and try to fly something off the ceiling. But oh, yeah. what a pain! But, in the, yeah, they don't have a budget. What a pain in the butt for that. So, yeah. and if it's most like if it's a gymnasium type of an area, it's probably girders up there. So bouncing the light off the ceiling, right, it's not going to work and such. So that would probably be the best is to use diffusers and uh, go from there. Wow. And that, that'll be uh, what? $75 a piece for a consulting fee on that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. Okay. Uh, we had another question that was in the chat. Uh, somebody was asking, do you think getting a, a DDJ SR uh, for beginning DJ is a good option? Sure. Why not? It's a nice little unit. And especially if you're using Serato, I mean, that's a Serato controller. You can, toggle it to use vdj or whatever you want but you're not completely using every button on the controller mm-hmm. care about that yeah sure that's a fine little piece and that was my question uh, coming back is which which software are they using now or if they're using any software at all yeah. you know maybe they haven't gotten into it yet and then if that case this would be great if you're going to get into serato 
Um, yeah, but I mean, you can use it for VDJ as well. You, you can toggle the unit. I forget how to do it. I, I do have a video up on it. So I've told people how to do it. I just can't remember how I told them to do it. But there's a toggle on there. It's really easy to do. You can toggle out and just have it as a general MIDI controller and, and map it out for VDJ or whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so I twisted uh, Mickey. If you, if you, uh, I'd be interested to share, share what software you're using. Um, that'd be, I'd be interested to uh, see what you're using and such. Cause that always helps. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. I think we did this one actually. I must not. I do like pioneer stuff like for MIDI controllers though. Uh, Cause they typically, uh, I, I would say from, from their mid grade stuff all the way into their high end stuff, they have really nice sound cards built in and the outputs are, are very clean and the EQs on this stuff the they're like kills. So if you go down on the bass, the bass is gone. Mm -hmm. If you turn the bass and the treble and the highs all the way down, you hear nothing. They're really clean that way. So I'm real big on Pioneer stuff for that reason. I, I thought a long time ago, well, it wasn't all that long ago, I guess, a few years back, I guess my, my whole attitude was, you know, it's all in the name. It's not that, you know, there's other options out there. This stuff, you know, cannot live up to the price tag. I'm a convert. I'm, I'm completely converted on that. Mm -hmm. I, I retract all of those statements I ever made because the stuff is, is worth it to me. It's yeah. clean and it's solid. So, and, and one point that you made is that kind of the midline to upper has the mm -hmm. better quality sound cards. Pioneer is just like all the other companies has got an entry level. That's yes. basically for the bedroom DJ and they they don't have the sound card capability or the quality that some of the other things. So you can't judge the SR or SZ or any of the higher level models by some of the, the, the things that, that they're selling at uh, Best Buy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no matter just... what name it has on it. Yeah. It, yeah I mean, we get it's... into the whole OEM thing, um, but we're not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're not going to get that. that the show is only a half hour long. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, some stuff uh, is designed by Pioneer, which is really cool. Some stuff is just kind of off the shelf from uh, uh, third party manufacturers and has the name put on it. There's nothing wrong with that. However, the stuff that Pioneer designs, which is the mid grade all the way up to the high end stuff, is is your better option in my opinion. Okay, our next question: um, Would you use an analog mixer these days, and if so, where would you use it? Uh, well, I don't. Yeah, I mean, why not? If, if you're if you're running turntables for like scratching and things like that, you can use analog club mixer you know i i have club mixers that are also midi compatible though so mm -hmm. um i don't know depends on what you're spending i guess and uh, yeah and if you're even if you're doing some old stuff with um if, if you're going to be doing multiple microphones for a ceremony you might need to be running a yeah. like a small band type mixer um mm -hmm. many companies have got a four and eight channel mixers that you can have multiple microphones and different things on there so yeah they, there's still uses for them out there. It's just that with most of our shows, you know, the controllers like the Pioneer or any number of the others. Yeah, I mean, I use them for the sound card. I mean, that's really the main thing. It's yeah. it's less about the buttons and the re and the wheels and everything on, on the controllers themselves or the mixers themselves. It's all about that sound card and those outputs to me. Yeah. I want it to sound good. I mean, technically, you can mix internally if you want to on your laptop. But, yeah, it's like the clean signal is, is what I'm all about. And, and I get that with, with the digital mixers, with the built-in sound cards, the good stuff. So. Our next question. Um, what's the best way to man handle my cables when it comes to wrapping and transportation? Could you repeat that, please? What is the best way to handle my cables, wires, um, when it comes to, to wrapping them and, or, or, yeah, wrapping them and transporting them? Well, okay. First of all, you're talking to a dude with one hand. So I don't do a lot of cable wrapping these days. Uh, what I use, and I've done videos on it, I use self-reeling cables. So I'm using, I think Stage Ninja makes my audio cables, my XLR cables, and Bayco, which I just, they do my AC cables, and that's like a Home Depot purchase. Mm. There are several companies out there that do, and mine are made by a company called Bayco. A... I think 15 to 20 foot extension cord, 20 foot extension cord is that costs more money than a, a standard one would, 
like a your, your orange extension cable. I think I'm paying like 30 bucks a piece for them, but they make my life easier. As far as anybody who has two hands, you want to take that one cuz cuz I don't that, I'm that's not my thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's 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 a a difficult one because there's I've got cord reels that I I watched your your video that you did oh, on really? that where where you were using that retractable and it's like, you know, that's and I I used to you have it where you do the gathering around the arm and elbow. And then I learned the over and under method right. of doing the cables and that works so much better. But there's times where it's like that cord reel is, is attractive. I know it put twists in the, in the cables and I've got some friends who've come with me and they're like, they, they cringe at how I'm handling my cables. Yeah. Oh, I've had that too. And Especially like, guys who are in the construction trades. Yeah. Oh, they get, oh, what are you doing? You're going to ruin those wires. It's like. There's chain methods. That, oh, we make a chain out of it. Oh, yes. I tell you what I struggle with, and, and I still have not figured out a great way to, to manage this stuff, IEC cables, just your standard light cables yes. that you plug into your lighting. I struggle with those with one hand. Oh, yeah. With the damn things. So what I usually do, especially if I'm by myself, I keep them. Uh, try to try to keep them on the shorter side of things, and I just shove them in a bag. Just... <laughs> exactly. There's not much more. Yeah. If yeah. if they're two feet long, how tangled can they get? Is yeah. is what I'm getting at. If they're ten feet long, yeah, I've got a spaghetti incident. But if they're like three feet long, how tangled can they get? Yeah, you just grab and shake a little bit, and it'll come right out. <laughs> right. Uh, Jimmy's talking about cable reels at Lowe's uh, and and uh, Ziploc gallon size Ziploc bags. With label, yeah, that would be way too much work to go. I, that, I, you know, and, and you know, my my pal uh, Danson David Ellsworth, he goes out and gigs with me sometimes. Um, well, okay, first of all, I got Andy. You know, my brother Andy's here, and he's when he does do things, he does them well. <laughs> so if he is going to wind cables for me, he's going to wind them beautifully. He's going to pack them away beautifully for me. Mm-hmm. And he does this as, you know, just to help me out. Oh, dude, my bag, my cable situation's a mess. Oh, I got this. And he'll take the time and do it. Mm-hmm. And then dancing David Ellsworth comes and gigs with me. And this guy, he don't know how to wind a cable. And if he does, he just refuses to do it. Cause he just takes everything and shoves in the bag. I'm like David, what are you doing? Andy had these wound up beautifully. We'll sort it out later. Let's just get the hell out of here. <laughs> but he doesn't sort them out later. He just leaves them tangled in the bag. And then and I can't yell at the guy. He's helping me out. He's helping out his crippled DJ friend. Thank you, David. But yeah, cables are a nightmare, man. I mean, wireless is a beautiful thing. And self reelers are cool. So if you're struggling with cable management, you join the club. Yeah, um, I, I think that's something most... Most of us will have that issue. That's for sure. Ah, let's see. I don't want it to. That one was. I don't want to get to that. I want to save that one. Have Ooh. we talked about scrims? Well, let's talk about scrims. Scrims. The question was: uh, Are scrims a fad? Should I invest in them? I don't think we yeah, talked about that one. Should they're cool? Of course, Gabe's a friend of mine. Uh, Gabe and Dina are friends of mine. I've been to their home. Uh, we're like family. But no, it's a cool product. When I was first introduced to that type of table dressing, it was through Steve Jones DJ skirts and it Mm -hmm. was the table jacket. And I thought it was brilliant. I still think it's brilliant. I wish that that one product was just made and you could buy it whenever you wanted to buy it because he just closed shop. Um, But I never really cared for much else that he built. He made a topper that I liked, but when it came to tripod dressings, I wasn't feeling it. It no. didn't look right to me. I didn't like it. And I tried it and it was just like velcro and it just looked, it looked I don't know. It didn't look right to me. The po- it was like the pole just had a cloth around it. I'm like what does that do for anybody? Yeah. And, and then when I saw uh Gabe's lycra designs for the tripods, I was like, "Whoa, this is kind of neat." Cuz you can do white and you can line them up and uh they're reflective. And the, the table has a real cool look to it. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're fat at all, especially the tripod scrims. I think they're great. What would you recommend uh, if somebody's wanting to get into it and just start out? Would you recommend going with the white or going with black? What I do is I do a black tablecloth. And the reason I do a black tablecloth is because it tends to make things look neater. My cables are black. 
So if I do a white tablecloth, they're gonna show, and I don't completely make everything perfect. It's gonna, look, it might look like hell, but I could have the same exact setup with the cables ran exactly the same way on a black scrim tablecloth, and it looks great because the black hides it. But I like white for the tripods because I like to use those as light sources. I like to put a par behind my tripods and use that light, that white lycra as a reflective um, thing for the dance floor. And the cool thing also about those, those lycra scrims for the tripods, if you want to wash a dance floor, it's like a filter. It, it's not harsh lights in anybody's eyes. Oh, I gotcha. Those, those kind of act as a filter. Uh, and, and, uh, and then it also gives people something to look at visually at the booth too. So something's happening. The six foot tall thing is lighting up. That's kind of neat. I still get compliments on that. I got a lot of compliments on my setup, uh, at my last wedding a week and a half ago. And I didn't think it was a particularly brilliant setup. It was fine. It was the micro system, but I didn't do anything special, but mm -hmm. boy, the, the other professionals in the wedding business who were there, were very impressed with that. They thought that was the coolest. They nice. love the look. So I, I like them. And are they a fad? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think they're good. There are still people in our industry who see this and say, this is cool. Yeah. So it's still, it's still something that people are appreciating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's because you guys see them every week in my pictures when I gig doesn't mean that everybody is seeing them every week. Yeah, very true. If that makes sense to you. Yep. Let's continue on here. We've yep. got a question. Um, uh, we got a couple of questions actually. Uh, what's the best way to, to diffuse light inside of a totem? Uh, a, a truss sock, a white truss sock. That's around the outside. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about an actual diffusing. You really wouldn't want to diffuse the light because you want that light to go shine right up that totem and shine yeah. up that sock. Yeah. But if you, if you put a sock on it, you might it with more of a wash. It might reflect more, but if you want to see the aluminum on there, yeah, you, you want the straight shot of that. You don't want to diffuse it. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. And I, I've, as I've been playing with the, the lights and putting them inside, I find that I'm trying to find, trying to use a, a lower profile light to get that light down as close to the bottom as possible. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it's like it's got six inches of black and then... Right. And you know what lights were perfect for that and they don't make them anymore? Hmm. The jelly pars. They were perfect for for, for uh, warming totems mm -hmm. because it was light all the way down because the casing was the glow was reflective of whatever color the light was. Yeah, so they were perfect. Oh, yeah. And I'm really happy that I, that I have an arsenal of those. I have... Uh, some little jelly pars, and I also have some jelly goes. I have four jelly goes. Oh, sure, you're set and, then. And uh, I'm yeah, super happy to have those. Mm -hmm. And and the jelly go par is like a sixty four can, so it's perfect to fit inside of a truss for holding a truss. That was the coolest tool for that. Yeah, and, and, uh, I haven't tried that. I, I should. I'll have to try that. Uh, if you have any sitting around, try it. Yeah, I've got uh, a set. If you're just trying to warm a totem, if that's all you're trying to do. It's more than enough, mm -hmm. and it's going to be nice and bright. And again, you're going to have light continuously all the way up and down the thing. Uh, okay, he's referring to avoiding that hot spot that you would have at the bottom of the uh, sock, or you know, the the uh, totem scrim. I don't have a hot spot down there. I, I haven't experienced that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you might see in a photograph, but the audience isn't going to see it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. The one I did. I, I did a couple of weeks ago. I used the five uh, P in that, and I don't remember it it being unusually bright. And I I was using right. a two meter. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you could use a narrower uh, beam spot, I guess, if it's an issue. But I, I've just never seen it as an issue, personally. Mm hmm. Okay. Let's see. Um. I uh, was speaking of scrims. Somebody asked about uh, facades. Is that is mm -hmm. that something that uh... facades are great if you're a slob, man? I mean, you can do whatever you want. And you can put a facade up and nobody knows. That's kind of like those those um, room dividers that people dress behind. <laughs> you can put anything behind a room divider. Nobody knows what's going on over there. It could be a pile of 
dirty diapers. And if they can't smell it, they don't know it's there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the cool thing about the facades, man. Nobody sees what your cabling situation is. You can have food back there. You can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. They can't see it. So they're, they're cool. I mean, people like them. Um, I, they're kind of hard for me to personally manage. So I don't use them a lot anymore. Yeah. But I used to use them. I used to be a very big believer in those. And when I had them up, you better believe I made the biggest mess behind them and nobody knew. No one had a clue what kind of mess I had. They thought, oh, what a nice, neat setup. In the meantime, I got cables everywhere and I got a plate of mashed potatoes over here. I stole from the buffet and empty glasses and bottles and crap everywhere. It was really cool. I liked it. <laughs> He's hiding, hiding my trash. Yeah, basically. I, I've gone back and forth on the facade thing. Uh, for a while, I, I didn't. And then I, I went with a, I had a huge one for a while because mm -hmm. that it was, it seemed like for a number of years back in the early 90s, it was how much we could drink and you'd have people crashing into your table and we were using CD <laughs> yeah. players at the time. So then it was putting a barbed wire fence in front of the facade. So you're trying to keep people back. Right. And 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 I've gotten to the point now, I'm, I'm at the other extent again, uh, where I, I just, I'd rather try to get as much away from that, um, seeing the dance floor and seeing the audience and things because hiding behind the gear just isn't as uh, appealing to me. And, and part of that might be is when I'm hiding behind the gear, I don't feel like I'm as connected with the crowd and, right. and being as responsive to them. So as a mobile DJ, I think that's important to me too. I want to really have that connection with the crowd when I'm put in a position where I'm not near the dance floor. <sighs> I, you know, in the old days, I mean, the booth, the clubs, I mean, you didn't even know where it was. Mm -hmm. You could go into a club and have no idea where the DJ was. Yeah. He's probably right. up there somewhere. Yes. Couldn't see their face. Maybe up there somewhere. I've never been up there. Never seen them. But I hear the booths up there. Uh, now, I mean, I, I yeah, I like to have that connection. Absolutely. It's important to me. And, and I think you've got a valid point with that. Um, Follow-up question. Have, we ever, um, have you ever played with pipe and drape? Yeah, I have, and it, it, and I think it's my personal opinion is it's it's a uh, putsy and and a mess because once you once you get it up, then it's like oh it's wrinkly, so now we should really steam it to make it yeah, look. Leave nice. that crap to the rental people, man. Yeah, that would and be my the people who rent circus tents and bouncy houses. That's a nice job. For this them. is this is why why uh, Gabriel has scrim the the lycra so you can stretch it. I mean that's DJ friendly. Right. <laughs> you can wad it up and shove it in a bag and who cares? You're going to iron it or nothing. No ironing needed. That's that's the big cool thing about Scrim. That's why it's better than a table jacket that, that was from DJ Skirt. You don't got to iron it. Uh, let's see. Where but if you have white, you got to wash it once in a while. Believe me, Blanca tells me that all the time. Yeah. She's yeah. going to get me. What the hell? You're just, I can't what? believe you're going out with this thing. Yeah, once the lights are down, no one knows. <laughs> Uh, one of our questions that was sent in is, what are some of the mistakes that mobile DJs, you, that you hear them or see them make when they're asking you questions? These are repeated mistakes that they're making. And you just like, I've, I've, I did that video. How many <laughs> times do I, you know, and we've, we've had that in our conversations here a little bit about that. But what are some of the things that you've seen them make time and time again? Well, you know... <laughs> I spend a lot of my day sending video links to people from my own videos. I spend a lot of my day doing searches on my own channel for videos to send links to people who, for some reason, didn't search videos right on my channel. They didn't feel like it. Uh, I don't know if there's one particular thing. And I don't always know that they're mistakes. I think it's just kind of a matter of opinion. Sometimes I do things different than other people. Um, I'm, I, my, my stuff on my videos and my opinions are just that they're my opinions. They're not, it's not gospel. Um, I think most of the mistakes that I'd see people make honestly is, is more in perhaps uninformed purchases. Sometimes mm -hmm. I do yeah, see I, a lot of that where they get very indecisive and they, they end up buying more stuff than they need, or they buy things and it doesn't work out for them because they didn't put the research in. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, I see a lot of people who don't make purchases because they're so worried that it's not going to work out for them and they're scared. And I, but I, you know, the, the people who I've been communicating with lately, John, I'll be honest with you, 
uh, seem pretty solid. I mean, everybody who's been communicating with me, uh, they I'm learning stuff from these people. Mm-hmm. I haven't had a, a lot of newbies say things to me like, how do I do my first wedding? That hasn't happened much lately. Uh, and I'm glad it hasn't happened. Maybe I've made enough videos called How Do I Do My First Wedding to Stop Asking Me That Question. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> I don't know. What mistakes are you seeing them make? Well, a couple of them, a couple of, uh, um, just with lighting, I'm going to mention a couple of these and we can, can go back and forth a little bit. But um, with lighting, the DJs like to shine those, those really bright, cool lights right down at the guests. On the yeah, dance floor. Hit by truck lighting. <laughs> yeah, and you get them in the eyes, and people can't see. And and I've talked about this in other videos where you got to keep in mind the people who are over forty five, over fifty, you know, over sixty, they cannot. They're going to turn around and try to look at that dance floor and see the bride and groom out there having fun, or see what's going on. And they're getting that that headlight type light coming through the guest at their eyes. They can't see what's going on. Compared I call that hit by truck lighting. And I did two videos that I can think of, and I revisited and revisited them lately just to see what I was doing a year ago, because I'll do that. Uh, one was called Train Wrecking a Light Show. Mm-hmm. And that's when there was just too much going on. It was like a circus. Yep. And I didn't mention that hit by truck lighting where you're shining those pars directly out and they're hitting people in the eyes. And then I did a dedicated video on hit by truck lighting where I was showing, you know, alternatives to shining your lights straight out of people to the side up down you know up to the side and then i was also showing the result of that yeah so yeah i mean it, but what's really cool is when i did those videos and i'm not trying to toot my own horn here but i did help people they did see this and say yeah you know what he's right and they tried it another way and, and i've been thanked a lot at shows Hey, thanks for that video because I was making that mistake and I didn't realize I was making it. Yeah. But thank you because I don't anymore. And I think, you know, people are happier and my, my dancers are making eye contact with me now. And it's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. I had a gentleman recently who uh, was in the Netherlands and he opened this really cool rave hall for the teenagers in his area. A really neat thing. And he was kind of doing that. He wanted attention on the DJ, but he had these, these uh, UV pars just shooting out from the stage and i'm like you need to get those off the stage put those shining at you you can be blinded who cares but don't blind your audience if you want them to see you you know get get the get the blinders off of them mm-hmm. and we used to use blinders a long time ago did you ever i don't know have did you ever use the aircraft landing lights uh yep 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 they just kind of like rock concert flash flash yeah, flash. yeah exactly like, yep. yep we had that basically yeah we've used those a little bit and I bet it was half a dozen shows. We used it when we got those. And then I, after that, you're like, you know, this isn't such a good idea. Well, you use them like once or twice and you're done. It's a lot of work, but it's a yeah, cool effect. For um, a few shows. And that's why it's like, yeah. Yeah, done. But the, the hit by truck lighting is like you're blending them for six hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not, <laughs> a, not a quick. But the other one, and you, you mentioned the other one uh, when it comes to the, the music where you're saying it was basically the, the lights going like it was a circus. And I've seen that where they're doing that and they've got the, all the different lights going and now there are no music. They're on a microphone. Okay. Now next we're going to be doing, and the lights are just going or it's now it's going to be a slow song. All the couples come on and the lights are just go. I mean, it's like, how tough is it? I understand that, you know, not everyone's going to use DMX. I don't do use it to the level right. of what I could, but goodness shut off that, that vertigo type, like shut off the beamer and maybe just go to floods. And maybe slow the floods down. I mean, that can happen. Here's an analogy I've been wanting to give on that for a long time, and I think this shows the appropriate place to give it. And it's inappropriate. But okay, that's great. Point. So we're talking. We've already talked about hookers and gay people. So I mean, it who, gets who, it gets who can we well, offend this time? We got gay people watching this right now. They're our friends on our, our <laughs> DJ program and, and sisters. Uh, <laughs> that's just who people are. But um, okay, heterosexual men. Or anyone who can appreciate the female form. Have you ever been flashed? Mm-hmm. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah, it was it, it was made for an interesting. And it's like for a second. It's like, whoa, did I really see it? And then they go away. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, no, no, no. You you got an eyeful. That's good. And you're pretty happy with that, right? It's something you're thinking about. It's, yeah. it's exciting. Can you imagine that for six hours? It would kind of lose 
its potency after about a minute. It wouldn't be cool anymore. You, you, it's embedded in your brain. It'd be like a National that, Geographic magazine. Yeah. It, it, well, it's a photo on your wall. You just look at it every day and it doesn't mean anything. That's kind of like a light. If you've got a really cool effect that's a wow effect, don't leave it on for six hours. Blow that thing off for a break in a song and then turn it off. And then don't use it anymore. And people are going to remember that. What was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was cool, but we're done with that now. That's cool. To me, that is awesome. And just sometimes if you've got a fixture that's wow, instead of turning it on with all the other fixtures, let it have a solo, almost mm -hmm. like its own little drum solo going on. Like I say, blow it off during a break and then kill it, never turn it back on and turn something else on for a while. Mix it up. I think that's cool. Well said. I like that flash analogy. I really can do I, I, it. That, that is a that is a good analogy because yeah. But if you think about it, that's kind of how it is, and that's how people think. So that is a a good way to describe that. Okay, and I want to make sure we have. I hope someone else appreciated my 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 titty flashing analogy. Yeah, exactly. I'm surprised <laughs> they left that one alone. I, I'm, you know, they no, jumped off. No, no, no. Campaign Jam, I think, liked it. Yeah, you get it called, Yeah, good tip, and and that works. But I mean, I, I, that, I an ace. Maybe that was for me. I don't know. But anyway, okay. Yeah, uh, the last last one we're going to talk about a little bit, and we've talked about this in the first show tonight. Uh, we've talked about this before, but somebody was wondering how much they charge for a wedding, and you know. We've we've uh, we've looked we talked about uh, you know the the rental and just kind of run through your breakdown again of what you what you uh, go through when you're breaking it down and talking to a bride to to explain your price point. Okay, so go down to like how I do it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, again. Okay. <laughs> I know we've we've done this before, and then I'm going to add one little aspect to it, and then we'll we'll wrap. Okay. Cool. So what I try to express to them is that you know my number is not a number that I picked out of thin air because it's really not. What I do is I try to think about how much all of my equipment is worth that I'm taking out to a gig. So if I've got $10,000 worth of, or let's say $6,000 worth of, or 10, 10 is good, let's go 10, $10,000 worth of DJ equipment, okay? Uh, what I want to do is charge a percentage for rental for that DJ equipment to go out. So for instance, if I charge 5%, that would be $500. If I charge 10%, that would be $1,000. That just depends on what you want to charge. I charge 5%. So I could say to a client, look, there's $10,000 worth of equipment here. And the rental fee on that is typically between 10 and 20 or 15 and 20%, but I only charge five. So that's $500 right there just for the rental of my equipment. I got to pay for it. And that's what it is. So in essence, what that means to you as a business person is, and 20 gigs, you'll pay for your equipment. Mm -hmm. And then your equipment will start making money for you because this is uh, like, like a, a rental piece for you. This, you own it. You should be making money off of it. So that's that. And then you have to figure out all your expenses, of phone, computer, all of that stuff. Divide it by the amount of gigs that you have per year. Those are your like office expenses. And then you have to figure out things like wear and tear on a vehicle or perhaps vehicle rental is the way to do it. If you are, uh, let's, and I figure like a tank of gas, mm -hmm. depending, you know, on, on every trip I need to make, I figure at least a tank of gas. Um, that's like a hundred bucks. Um, I don't know. Geez. There are things like, um, music expenses. And the way I do that is, I mean, who, who knows how much your music library is worth, but what I do is I think about my currents. So I take the amount of money that I spend on my currents per year and I divide that by the amount of gigs that I have and that's how much money it's going to cost me to provide music for these people. Sure. And that's not even counting things like the digital downloads and, oh, we want to hear this, you know, B-side of Marshall Tucker band that you got to get off iTunes or Amazon or whatever. But that should help cover your music costs pretty well. Mm -hmm. You go through all of these types of things and at the end you have a total. And maybe your total is $800, $900 or whatever. And then you say to your client, and now I have to pay myself. And they say, oh, okay. So everything above and beyond your expenses is what you're making. That's your fee. And if you've got 
you know, I don't know, let's say 30 hours into a gig and, and you're charging $1,800 for, for your services, then, you know, that's, that's not outrageous for, for a full work week for someone to make. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the breakdown. And you, you have to figure everything and you have to figure in your liability insurance, any of your business expenses. Yeah, it all has to be there. So that, that's, that's how I do it. That's how it makes sense to the client. Exactly. And, and it's, it's, a, all, it's honest. It's, uh, it's not like a number I picked out of thin air. How much can I get out of these people? Mm-hmm. No, it, these are real numbers. And I think people appreciate that. I think so too. I think so too. Um, one, one spot that um, if you go and you do a search for cost of DJ in a, a geographic location, there's numerous websites out there that will give you numbers and such. One that's used quite often is a website, uh, costofwedding.com. Mm-hmm. And I'll put that uh, link in the in the comments area. I'm going to wait until it gets closer to when that statement is said, so then it'll pop up at the same time. Otherwise, you guys won't understand why it's there. But cost of wedding, um, if you do a search for that and such, this was actually what last night when uh, uh, Mike Schnauder and I were talking difference between northern weddings and southern weddings. This is the website he used. And if you do a little researching in my geographic area, no, excuse me, excuse me, the, the geographic area of the gentleman who asked this question, he's up in the Fargo area. And I did a little research on that. And it said kind of a, a average DJ price is going to run from 473 to, to 789. Mm-hmm. Uh, higher end DJs are from about 950 to 12, 1250 plus. Mm-hmm. The interesting part was the band, the bands up in Fargo for a higher end band, you're about 2,200 to about 3,000. Yeah. I would think that bands, a uh, higher end band would be way more than 3,000. I, I, it always floors yeah. me that a five or six per, person band with a sound tech, they're mm-hmm. making per person less money than most DJs. Usually, yes. It's crazy to me. Yeah. Usually that's the way to go. I mean, that's the way it is. Yeah. My brother-in-law used to be in a wedding band, and and uh, I mean, I don't know. This was back in the eighties, but it might have been a hundred bucks, an extra hundred bucks on a Saturday if he was lucky. Yeah, that's just. And he had to have a really nice guitar, you know. Oh yeah, and practice and have and have, rehearsal. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. They had to get together and practice. Not saying that we don't practice, but I can come out here at any time. I don't have to. Okay, honey, I've got to go drive to meet the other guys and be gone for three hours. We have to be able to perform, you know, our own thing here, but a band has to be able to be in sync with four or five other people. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And learning new music and, yeah. And you get to deal with four or five different personalities and their ex-wives and their kids and, you know, their colds and their whatever drama is happening. Yeah, DJ is the way to go as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, gang, we're going to wrap things up. That puts us at about 45 minutes for tonight. And just checking the chat and see if it looks like everyone's just kind of talking numbers and such with yeah. uh, what's going on. You, you, if you mention pricing to DJs, they're just going to take that and they're never going to shut up and yeah. they're going to debate it forever. So if you ever want to occupy a room full of DJs, say, I think you should charge $1,000 per gig and everyone should do it. And, and dude, just walk away. They're going to occupy themselves for hours. <laughs> You don't need to do anything else. When it comes to money, these people lose their heads. They just go crazy. <laughs> That's why I like to talk about things like, you know, music and performance. Uh, when it starts getting technical and all that stuff, people just lose their heads. They don't know what to do anymore. Yeah, yeah that we, we definitely see that. So. Once again, everyone, thank you for watching. We will be back next Tuesday. And then in a couple of weeks here, we, we've got this thing called DJ Expo coming up. It's a little three, four weeks out. Oh yeah, that thing. And yeah. we're gonna we'll be there, by the way. We'll People be there, me. and we're gonna see what we can do on Tuesday night. We're not gonna make any promises, but we're hoping, you know, if because we we have trans we we did transmit from DJ Expo a couple of years ago, I think it was. I don't know if we did last year. Was well, it last we year? did Mobile Beat. We did Mobile Beat. Yeah, we did a real show there, but I think we yeah. did we did something. I think we had Sean uh, Denard with us. Wasn't that in? Uh-huh. Oh, I don't remember, but yeah, we, we're going to see what we can do from Atlantic City when we're out there for um, for for the show. So it'd be fun to do like a man on the street thing on the boardwalk live. That, that would be, be cool, fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, we could we could do just that. grab a random person. Hey, what do you think of DJs? We could easily we can easily do that. We probably, well, not easily, but it could be done. I mean, it could be done not, not on our budget, not on our salary. Yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll rent one of those little guys to push the cart along, and we could actually, yeah, you know. 
have all the gear in one side of the thing. Yeah, we could we could do this. We can do this. Yeah, we could have somebody ride the bicycle, someone shoot it, and we just sit there and chill out and have have fun. I don't know. Feed feed the 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 attack pigeons. Yeah, exactly. Feed the the feathered rats that come roaring through there. <laughs> Get off the boardwalk somewhere and uh, you know listen for gunshots. It's Atlantic City. It's a real interesting it's place. <laughs> uh, great stuff. If you guys are, if you liked uh, the show tonight, please click the like or the thumbs up button. We sure appreciate that. If you have any questions, get those to us via Facebook Messenger, uh, email. Uh, some guys send things via email or put those in the comments down below after the show, not on the side. On the side, we just can't see those in about fifteen minutes. So, Brian, thank I love you. it. I love it to watch the comment section like about a minute after I said something, and then I finally see the replies because of the delay. It's kind of funny. Yeah, they, they, I good. love it. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and watching this absurd broadcast that we do every week. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I'm glad that you have the time to do this. I, I and I do appreciate your time and your comments and your views and your likes. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, gang. Catch you later next week. Good night.